Good morning, Christian Church of Litchfield. Hey, we welcome you to our services uh, today. We're really glad uh, you're here. D do we have any runners here today? Uh, Carol's a runner. Um, you've ran half marathons. Have you ever ran a marathon? Okay, but you've done half marathons. So has our daughter, Beth, you know. And uh, I, I knew you entered a lot of them, but I didn't know if you'd done the marathon yet or not. But, uh, yeah, you know, I'm not a runner. You know, I, uh, I remember a few years ago when Litchfield had the half marathon uh, run, our kids, uh, Beth and Mark, participated in it. And it wore me out. I mean to tell you, I was part of the cheering squad, you know, and, and hundreds were lined up, go, 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 and they all took off that morning, as windy as cold, and then we had to go to Old 66 and eat a large order of biscuits and gravy, and uh, <laughs> hurry up and get back to the next spot where they'd be coming by, that's it, go, 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 you know, and they're patting and puffing, and then we'd go to McDonald's for another break, and then we'd come back about 45 minutes later, I said, man, this wearing me out. Uh, and I remember still both of them saying after that race, they said, oh, they said, I can't, can't describe to you uh, what we're feeling. You know, we're not feeling anything. We're just numb by this point. The pain has already turned to numbness. And uh, Beth, she still runs. Uh, she'll call me up on Saturday mornings, uh, like 7.30, and she'll say, hey, Dad, I knew you'd be up already, and good, I've been up for a long time, and she said, uh, I just got in from running six miles. I go, wow. She told me, she said, Dad, I feel invigorated when I run. She said, I'm like that guy in Chariots of Fire that said, when I run, I feel the pleasure of God. When I run, I think I know what hell's going to be like. <laughs> I knew I'd get an amen on that. Now, a half a marathon is 13.1 miles. 13.1 miles. Do you realize that's 13 miles further than you'll ever have to run in your life? You know, and, uh, but, uh, man, one marathon runner said this. He said, you're never going to do anything great in life until you learn to move beyond tired. To run marathons, you got to do that. You know what I discovered? That's pretty true in life, isn't it? Anything you do, whether you're building a business or <laughs> whether you're, you're, you're building a life, you got to move beyond tired. Whether you're going to college or school or whether you're going to work, you sometimes have to move beyond, beyond tired. I remember as a kid, I had this stupid idea that dads didn't get tired. You know what I'm talking about? It'd be late at night, you get in the car and you start driving and dads, you know, what happened? You go asleep. What's the next thing you know? You're waking up and the sun's shining in your bedroom window and you think, wow, dad drove home, he picked me up, carried me in the house, tucked me in bed, and next thing I know it's a sunny morning, you know. And as a kid I thought, dads just don't get tired. And then I became one. I became a dad, that is, and <laughs> yeah, late at night, are you tired, honey? Nope, I'm fine. You need to pull over? Nope. You want me to drive? Nope, I'm fine. Uh, maybe I'll take a break and head rest. Nope, I'm all right. Guys want to be macho tough. We lie. <laughs> we want, you know, we're like the guy that says, when I die, I want to die like Grandpa died. Gently and quietly and peacefully in my sleep not screaming and hollering like the rest of the passengers in his car, you know, so <laughs> we get tired. And I don't know what you do, but you're going to have to be refreshed. What do you do when you get tired? I, I mean, when you're running on empty, uh, do you get one of those jolt drinks, you know, or, or uh, uh, I, I don't know what they're called, but I, I, 
I got one because it's the cheapest thing one day, and I just thought it was like iced tea. And <laughs> Lisa told me, she goes, I didn't think you drank that stuff. She says, that is potent. That's got more caffeine than a dozen Mountain Dews. I said, man, I've been feeling good all day, you know. <laughs> I think I could run that marathon. And, uh, you know, so I don't know what you do if you live on caffeine, Cokes, and, and, and chocolate bars to get you through uh, uh, cramming for the finals the night before or, or something hanging over you, and you just got to stay awake. It'll get you through in a pinch, but you can't live on that stuff, can you? It'll kill you, that junk will. It'll make you ugly and fat at first, and then it'll kill you. But uh, you just can't live on that stuff. Here's the question. The Christian life and living for Jesus is a marathon. And you're going to have to be refreshed because you're, you're going to become weary, and you're going to get tired. And what you do and how you respond will determine whether or not you just start or whether you just fall by the wayside and say, I'm not running that marathon. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this, Therefore I urge you, brethren, and this is the key to it. Here's the key. If you want to know how you can finish the Christian life, we're going to look at it today. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Well, that's what we ought to do. Give our lives to God as a living sacrifice. Live for him every day. Sacrifice means give yourself up. Even when you're tired, how do you do it? Verse 2 is the key. Verse 2, let's look at it. Now, we're going to have some audience participation here. I'll tell you in just a moment. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. That's where you become refreshed. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Okay, ladies, we're going to have you, gals, women, <laughs> females, we're going to have you say, conform. Do not. Conform. That's pretty weak, but that's all right. Guys, you're going to come on a lot stronger. To the pattern of this world, but be, your word, of course, is transformed. You call cows or hogs for a living? Yeah? <laughs> oh, hey. I love it, man. I love it. That's a far better response than I expected. Okay, we're going to try to get serious here. That word conformed is, and here's where you get wore out. The world is constantly trying to squeeze you, and that's what it literally means. An old translation used to say, don't let the world squeeze you into its mode to be like them, which is the exact opposite of where God wants you to be. And so this is, this is tough. Don't, you're going to have to overcome this. You're going to have to be refreshed. So let's repeat it again, that first part. Do not Transform. to the pattern of this world, but be Transform. I think it's better the first time, but <laughs> by the renewing of your mind. One more time, guys, and this is so important, because you got to get this right. All of us can take our fingers like this, put them like I have. Folks, this is where the battle is fought. And here's where it's going to be won or lost, right here. That's what the Bible says. Don't conform to the pattern of this world. What are we talking about? Oh, man, kids understand it. I got to wear what they wear. I got to buy the jeans they buy. I got to buy the shoes they wear. I've got to go where they go. I got to talk like they talk. I got to act like they act. I got to drink what they drink. I got to smoke what they smoke. I got to do what they do. That's conform. And it'll take you down. It'll take you down out of the race for God. You just fall by the wayside. That's what we're going to avoid. Don't be conformed to the past. Be transformed. 
in your mind, we have to have a completely different mindset. One last time. Okay, let's hear it. Do not <laughs> to the pattern of this world, but be by the renewing of your mind, then you'll be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We're going to look today at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, because it's such a great analogy uh, for us here. And we're going to look at this passage of scripture in 1 Corinthians, and we're going to 1 Corinthians 10. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud. They all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. He's talking about Israel in the Old Testament. They came out of Egyptian bondage because God brought some miraculous plagues and brought Pharaoh to his knees. He parted the Red Sea and they crossed on dry ground. It wasn't over. They were just beginning. It was a marathon to the promised land, but they never made it. They fell by the wayside, verses 3 and 4. They all ate the same spiritual food, drank the same spiritual drink. They were all starting out. So, man, we're running for God. We're headed to the promised land. And that spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. But verse 5 really flips on us. Here we go. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. What we're going to do today, we're going to use an analogy of an escalator. I remember when our, our kids were little and uh, we would go shopping around Christmas, and Sam would say, you're going to have to watch the three kids while I go get the gifts. I don't want them to see and know. Wow, three kids. How do you entertain them? And so we're going through the and escalators. Yeah. So we go up escalators. We went down escalators. And then they said, Dad, we really don't want you going with us. We can do this on our own. Yes, when they were real little kids. I go, well, well, that's what dads do real well. Well, well, I, I, um, well, I don't worry. You ain't going to run off when you get up there, are you? You know, and uh, mom ain't going to like it if I come up three short. Uh, but uh, no, no, we'll come. And I'm watching them, and they, and they come down. They go up, and they come down. But I'll never forget. They got talking, and they heard voices that only kids can hear. They said, Dad, think I can go up that down escalator? No, there's people coming down that down escalator. You know, there's going to be an accident. It's going to be horrible. I said, too many people here. It's Christmas time. It'd have to be empty for you to do that. And it's not empty. And so <laughs> it's only time Dad <laughs> exercised authority. No, you're not going up the down escalator. But that's what we're going to talk about today and we're going to illustrate it in fact I need some volunteers I've picked some people number one somebody that's six three some big guy some big handsome tall guy uh, how about uh, Aaron hey 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 give him a hand look at that good looking young man on I think it's on now okay you want to step over here Aaron ah thank you for participating um, <laughs> you have no idea what we're doing up here do you no. No. makes two of us all right <laughs> we'll come to Aaron in just a second let's read this next verse verse 6 now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. They are taking the down escalator. This is what we're going to do in this first half. We're going to look at the down escalator. How it is, it will take you down, take you out of the Christian life, out of the marathon. And the first thing it says is they set their hearts on evil things. 
So you're going to repeat thinking about it. And you only have to say it when I point to you. Okay? Good. I'm thinking about it. He's thinking about it. He hasn't done anything wrong or sinful. He's just thinking about it. Good. I mean, after all, God can't send people to hell if they just thinking about it. Yeah, right. Just thinking about it. I mean, is there any harm in thinking about it? He's good. You know, man. I said, God, dear God, help me pick out the right people for this. Yeah. I'm just going to the movies. I'm just watching. I would never do that, what I see. But we begin that down escalator because watching that movie causes us to begin. I'm thinking about it. Thinking about it. Yeah. That's why what you read, what you watch on the computer, and the movies and the entertainment that we go to is, is real important because of the fact it can take us away from God because we start thinking about it. Yeah, things that we shouldn't be thinking about. We say, oh, I would never do it. Yeah. We know that. But that first step is such a big one down that slippery slope of just thinking about it. Yeah, thanks. Okay, need another volunteer. Somebody about uh, 513, 512, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, who's six foot six one? A couple inches. Okay, Ben Bishop. All right. We got a microphone for him. All right. I think you're wired and you're ready. I'm thinking about it too. Well, <laughs> don't think about it. He's going to do thinking about it. You're going to do the next one. Let's read the next verse, verse 7. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. How is it you go from thinking about it to idolatry? And most of us can't even grasp, especially young people, maybe gasp what, grasp what idolatry is. Let's look at that second step down the down escalator. We're going to call it rationalizing it. Two words for you to remember. You got it? Rationalizing it. And when I point to you, I might need some, some community participation. <laughs> Rationalizing right, it. Right. <laughs> okay. So here's what we're talking about. We are now moving from thinking about it to rationalizing it. And rationalizing <laughs> it is where after I have think about it, thought about it, think about it, thunk about it, I begin to say, well, no one's perfect. And the moment I, I use that statement, no one's perfect, I am rationalizing it. Rationalizing it, yeah. And I say, well, well, everybody else is doing it and that. Rationalizing it. That's rationalizing it. Yeah. Rationalizing it. And I say, surely God's not going to send me to hell for one, one little wrong, is he? That's rationalizing it. Rationalizing it. And so you see the process that Satan works to take us out of the marathon of running the life for Jesus is he begins by telling us. I'm thinking about it. Yeah, I'm just thinking about it. Harmless. But then we move to that next step down and we. Rationalizing it. And we say, wow, y y y y y you know, it looks good. And you know what? Nobody's going to get hurt. That is rationalizing it. 
Okay, need another volunteer. Okay, uh, and you guys had no idea what you were going to do when you came up here, did you? No, but boy, they're doing a great job, aren't, aren't they? Number three, I need somebody about uh, five, six, five, seven. Curtis, I see him getting up. I talked to him. All right. All right. We've got a mic for Curtis. Hey, you're live. All right. Next verse, let's read. We should not commit sexual morality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. So, Curtis, what we're going to do is we now move from thinking about it, rationalizing it, to doing, doing it. it. Yeah. You see that slippery slope? This is the slope that Israel took. It's the one that Adam and Eve took, which we're going to talk about in a moment from the garden. And it's the same one that you and I take as we fall away from, from God. You never just wake up one day and say, I'm going to do something stupid. That's what sin is. Above everything else, it's stupid. But you never just wake up and say, I'm going to do something stupid without first thinking about it. And after you've thought about it, then you rationalize, you it. rationalize it. And only then do you do it. Do it. Yeah. I remember when... Uh, I was a young kid, didn't even have my driver's license yet, but I was into speed. The only thing I could drive was tractors, you know. And I had a cousin, Mike Pabarkas, uh, professor at St. Louis Christian College now, and uh, he grew up in a strong Christian family just like myself. But when we got together, it just seemed like, it just seemed like, the devil got a hold of us. You know what I mean? He just wasn't a good influence on me. You know, and, uh, but uh, I came up with the bad ideas. He should have stopped me because he was older than I am. He's two months older than I am. Should be a more mature and wiser and stopped me from it, but he didn't. And uh, in fact, I think he encouraged him. And I, I remember one day telling him, we were talking about tractors, and when he'd come down to the farm from Springfield where he lived, he'd get to drive his grandpa, uh, Shirley Smith's tractor, you know. And uh, so I was telling him, I saw we had was a Ferguson, and I said, that thing goes about 9, 10 mile an hour in high gear, you know. And I said, but uh, then we got John Deere 3010, and I told him, it's fast. I bet it's twice as fast. And God is my witness. I don't remember who came up with the idea. But we decided one day when nobody was at the farm, he and I were going dry grazing. Yeah. I told you, sin's stupid. And, uh, and I tell you how stupid it was. It's not bad enough to race them out in the field. We took them on the road, and we were racing up the hill, up a hill, two tractors, dry grazing. Yeah. And I won, but I mean, hey, you know, that doesn't matter. But uh, anyway, as I passed him, I'll never forget, he turns to look at me. I mean, we're not, we're not even old enough to drive a car yet. We're about 15 years old. Uh, and he turns to look at me. When he turns his head and his body, he also turned the steering wheel. <laughs> Boom! They just banged off each other. And, oh! You know, we immediately went inside, looked, and it bent the rim on the new John Deere that we had. Oh, man. I thought, I'm history. I'm going to die at 15. My life is over. <laughs> You know, and you know what I did? I did another stupid thing. I, I backed it in the barn, and I backed that tire against the wall as far as I could get it so that Dad didn't see it. And I prayed we wouldn't use that tractor for a while, and we did it. It was, it was maybe two, three weeks later, Dad got the tractor out. He didn't even notice it that day until one day he looks, and he goes, I must have hit something. I go, what? What, Dad? What? He goes, that rim is bent. I go, really? Oh. <laughs> I'd like to tell you I came clean and, and you, you know, was honest. No. That was one of the worst things that could have happened to me. Because it taught me 
if you're sneaky and careful, no one will find out. And they don't know what you are thinking about. <laughs> and they don't know what's going on in my mind that I am now rationalizing. And they may not even find out doing it when I'm doing it. And so later, when we became teenagers, we now drive race cars. You know, someone said, God takes care of fools and infants. I know what category I'm in. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm glad that <laughs> he saved me from that. But uh, only by his grace am I here today. I shouldn't have lived beyond 15, honest. Looking back, I said, I, I can't imagine, you know. And here's what I'm afraid of, and I use that example, not for you to go out to dry grace. But some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you are thinking, everybody thinks I'm pretty good because they don't know what I am thinking about. But you keep thinking about and that would take you to rationalizing it and then if you're really good and sneaky and clever doing it nobody ever knows you look pretty good that's the down escalator one more I think Logan you want to come up here and uh, get you a mic here Oh, I, I appreciate your participation today, guys. Man, we got a good group of good-looking guys here. Uh, now we're going to look at our next verse. that will take us to that last step. Although they knew or know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do the very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, we were in 1 Corinthians 10. And had we kept reading on, it would have simply said, the people began to grumble and complain about God's judgment. Who are you, God? That takes us to the number four step downhill. And you're going to say? Defending it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really bad when you get to the point that you doing it. That you're doing it. But after a while, you begin to defend it. Yeah. And when people say, hey, I, I, I want to come and, and talk to you about something. Uh, I, I really care about you. And your response is defending it. I'm defending it. Who are you? You think you're better than I am? And when you make those statements, you are? Defending it. Yeah. Isn't that what Adam and Eve did in the garden? I mean, it all began. They had everything. I mean, it was perfect. You know, it couldn't be any better. The weather was perfect. It's not like the Northeast, not even like here. It was just perfect, perfect weather. And then one day, in the garden, she meets the tempter. Eve does. And he says, has God said you, you, you may not eat uh, 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 of, of the trees of the garden? And she said, we may eat freely of the trees of the garden. But that one, God says, don't eat it, don't touch it. You, you, you die. And he says, did you hear him right? Did God, and that's what he words it, did God really say Right there, he began to have her because she was thinking now about it. thinking about it. And the more she thinking about it. was thinking about it, the more she realized it really looks good. It looks like a peanut butter parfait, perhaps. I mean, it really looks good. And I think, she says, it would make me wise and smart like God if I do it and she is now thinking about it thinking about it, thinking about it 
but then takes it to the, to the next step. And she's thinking, well, who doesn't want to be smart? I'll be smart like God. This would be good for me. She is now rationalizing it. Uh-huh. You better believe it. Rationalizing it. Yeah, well, well, yeah. But then she, of course, we know how it ends up. Doing it. Yeah. And then God comes to Adam. She gave to <laughs> Adam. And uh, he ate. And then God comes in the garden. And he says, Adam, where are you? And they were hiding. And he says, he gave him a chance to come clean. Have you eaten of the tree I told you not to? He was like me. He lied. He didn't take it like a man and say, I, I did. I'm wrong. No. You know what he did? Defended it. He sure did. What did he say? The woman you gave me, God. He didn't mention himself. The woman, and by the way, you gave me that one. We really should have had a recall on Motto Eve here. You know, uh, she was faulty. It wasn't me. It was a woman you gave me. It's your idea. I needed her. I didn't ask for her. That's defending it. Defending it. Don't need you, God. Now, here's the problem. When you get to the point that you are defending it, most of those people aren't in church. They're not hearing this message today. They've already dropped out. And that's the danger when you just, first of all, start thinking about it. Thinking about it. It's harmless. I haven't done it. I would never do it. Well, there may be some reasons for it, and that is rationalize it. And it's a small step to number three. Doing it. And then your heart becomes hard, and, and you begin to defend it. Yeah, let's give these people a big, big hand of applause. Thank you, guys. You can put your mics up. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Man, they did an excellent job. I really, really appreciate it. Now, it'd be horrible to leave you like that, but there is an answer. There is an answer, and we're going to read on in our scripture here. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Don't point your finger to me this morning and say, Preacher, I would never do that. You have to, first of all, number one this morning to come clean is this. Recognize it. Recognize it. Man, you got to... You got to say, God, forgive me. Help me turn my mind around. Help me start to reading your word instead of the garbage of this world. The battles won or lost in the mind. I don't want to conform. I don't want to watch what everybody watches. I don't want to think like they, I don't want to do what they do. If you're going to turn around, you got to come clean. Be honest and say, it's mine. Take ownership for it. Those thoughts need to be repented of. Number two, let's read the next verse. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful and he'll not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way so that you can endure it. Number two, repent of it. You got to say God's faithful. He'll give you a way out. He'll help you out. Even if you're just thinking about it and maybe you've moved on to rationalizing or even doing it. Maybe even defending it. It's time just to give it up and say, I recognize I've sinned, God. And by your grace, you, you can transform my mind. My life can turn around. I can get back in that race. I can run that marathon for you. Let's read on. <coughs> read that for me if you would. Number three. Run for it. Run for it. You've got to bust it. Now, here's where it's really tough. Because you're going to find yourself that running the Christian life is not only a marathon, it's not only difficult, 
it's really going uphill. If we were to illustrate the escalator that you take, it's not the one that you just get on, it just carries you along. This is where you take that challenge and you say, I'm going to, I'm going to bust, I'm going to run harder than the pressure coming down. I'm going to go up the down elevator. And there's people in your way. They want to take you down. Come on, it's fun. And they're going to pressure you to conform. But any dead fish can go downstream. You got to be alive to go against the current. And God calls you and I. He calls us, man, to run for it, to bust it. And his grace is sufficient. I don't know where you're at today, but as we come to decision time, you know, Jesus is faithful. Jesus is good. And he, wherever you're at, he's reaching out to you and he's calling you. And he's saying, change that thinking. Whether you're rationalizing it, whether you're thinking about it, whether you're doing it, whether you're defending it, wherever you're at, turn it around today and you can by his grace. He's faithful. He's provided a way for you to come, to come clean. You know, maybe some of you today have some stuff going on in your life that nobody in your family knows, let alone anybody else in the church or the world, and you think, nobody's, done, nobody's getting hurt. Well, there's somebody that knows, and it's not your preacher. It's God. And you have an appointment to, with him just like Adam and Eve, and you'll come clean either now or in the day of judgment. We encourage you, come clean with him today. His grace is sufficient to cleanse us of our stains and of our sins. Maybe you need to accept him as your Lord and Savior and be baptized this morning. Whatever your decision is, won't you come as we stand and sing our invitation hymn. Please be seated. It's a real special day when your granddaughter uh, decides to accept Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. Uh, McKenna has talked to her mom and dad a lot about this. You've talked to me uh, some about it, and yesterday we had a long talk about it, didn't we? And uh, I, one of the things I asked her was, I said, well, you haven't done anything wrong. You haven't sinned, have you? And she goes, oh, yeah. She says, I have, I have sinned. And she said, everybody has sinned. And then she made a very interesting statement. She says, even the Chandler kids have sinned, and they're about the best kids I know. <laughs> That's a quote, yeah. That's a compliment to you guys. That's about the best kids that she knows. And she says, but they've sinned too, Grandpa. And uh, so we talked about sin, we talked about baptism, and I'd like to say, yeah, she's making the decision today because of her uh, grandpa, but that's not true. It's because of her mom and dad. Uh, she told me, which I already knew this, because she's told me so many times, and others have too, but every night your dad reads to you the Bible, doesn't he? And uh, probably few kids grow up hearing more of the scriptures read to you by their dad than, than you've been blessed with, and I'm really thankful for that, McKenna. Would you repeat after me? I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. God bless you, McKenna. We love you as you come to accept Christ today and to be buried with him in Christian baptism. We're going to prepare for our baptismal service at this time. I'll say uh, I'm glad me and McKenna don't play together a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Calling your buddies out right in front of the church. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, isn't it an awesome morning um, when we get to see a young child like that come before the church and accept God? You know, we think about it as we was talking this morning, and um, you think about when you back when you were that young and what your thoughts were and how pure your heart was, and it's just awesome to see somebody come at that age and accept God, accept Christ. I'm going to read from Acts 2:36. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to show that you have received forgiveness for your sins. 
Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you and to your children and even to the Gentiles, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, it's such an exciting morning as we come to you as a body of believers. We're just grateful for um, McKenna's life, for her decision, and for her family. Lord, who loves her so much. We just pray now that um, us as Christians around her, Lord, can support her, help to guide her, and just keep teaching her and showing her the right way, Lord, as you have taught us. We're just grateful for all that you do, Lord, and for your plan of salvation that gives us eternity. It's in your son's precious name we pray.